a look at historical views of whether the Second Amendment protects an individual right with lawyer Costas Morris. Plus, Mexico takes American gun companies back to court. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I made the devil run. I gave him poison just for fun. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also the founder of the Reload.com, where you can head over and check out our reporting and analysis today. You can sign up for our free newsletter if you want to get a taste of, of uh, what we do. We give you a free uh, newsletter to your inbox every Monday. Sorry, every Friday. Wow. Uh, uh, my brain is a little fried here uh, on, on this Friday. But uh, yeah, free newsletter that gives you all of the most important gun news of the week into your inbox. And if you want to go a bit deeper and support our reporting, you can also buy a membership over at thereload.com, where you'll get access to our Sunday newsletter, which has analysis for the biggest stories of the week. So you can get better insight that you can't get anywhere else into what's going on with guns in America. Uh, and you also get this podcast a day early and have the opportunity to appear on the show uh, during one of our member segments. We had one just last week, if you want to check out what that's like. So this week, we are talking to Constos Moros from uh, my, uh, Michelle and Associates, which does a lot of legal work for the California Rifle, uh, <laughs> California Rifle and Pistol Association, uh, and who also is my co-author on a recent analysis piece over the the. The Reload, which we've actually made free for everyone, um, it's sort of a uh, look into the second generation of Americans and what they thought about the Second Amendment and uh, as to gauge whether or not the idea that it protects an individual right is a modern invention, as has been commonly argued over the years. Uh, you sort of you hear this a lot, the NRA made up or, or whatever boogeyman on the right. Uh, or the gun rights movement made up this idea that the Second Amendment protects uh, every individual's right to keep and bear arms. Uh, is that true? Is this made up? Did it happen just in the last 50 years? Or did people believe this uh, even back during the founding and, and 19th century eras? So that's what our piece looks at. And that's uh, why we have uh, Costos on today. Welcome to the show. Why don't you tell people a little bit more about yourself and and maybe correct my pronunciation. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, I, so, so for the listeners who aren't aware, uh, Stephen spent the last half hour reading anti-federalist papers and trying to make sense of the Second Amendment and its prior versions. So you'll have to forgive his brain being a little jumbled. So yeah, my name is Costas. I work for Michelle and Associates. Um, we are uh, we commonly represent the California Rifle and Pistol Association in uh, a lot of cases. Uh, I I'm uh, I, I'm get my. I'm nowhere near the attorney. Most of my colleagues are. I'm the one that's on Twitter too much, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, th they do fantastic work. Uh, I think our most high profile case of recent years was uh, Duncan. Uh, that that was that led to Freedom Week in California. So yes, that was the magazine ban uh, yes, in California. Yes, which for for a brief period of time was found uh, well for, was found unconstitutional, but for a brief very period of time that decision was not stayed, and so. Uh, magazine, the magazine limit in California was lifted uh, until the Ninth Circuit later intervened to yes. block, uh, and then ultimately, uh, they ultimately the Ninth Circuit ruled against you guys, right? Correct. So we uh, and I say we. This was my colleague's case. In fact, I went and got this job at Michelle and Associates because of Freedom Week. I, that's that's mm. what made me learn about them. But. Ooh, interesting. Uh, but we, uh, uh, my colleagues, won at, on the three-judge panel in Duncan, then mm -hmm. got, as all Ninth Circuit wins are until Bruin, yes. and hopefully now it'll change, but we got reversed in bank. We appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ha now vacated and remanded the, right. the decision to, for more in line in Bruin. And right yes, now we're going to be, yeah. That's one of the GVR cases. Actually, yeah, well, real quick before we start talking about uh, historical texts and 19th century writing, which <laughs> which will fry your brain a little bit. Uh, and Grammarly, by the way, especially hates because it's all <laughs> passive voice and there's lots of extra words that are not necessary to make the <laughs> point. But uh, before we get to that, why don't you give us just a quick update on Duncan? What, what's the latest in that case? So the latest is um, that now it's back with Judge Benitez because the Ninth Circuit, although we ask that they not remand it because we don't think there's much more to do at the district court level. Judge Benitez already did an extensive examination of the history. The state 
uh, did its history and mostly cited 20th century laws and exclusively cited 20th century laws. Um, so now we're back with Benitez and he's ordered briefing due next month. And all by all by all signs, he appears ready to move this forward quickly. However, uh, just a couple days ago, the state side, the state sent in a motion to extend the case for five months because they say they need to do expert discovery uh, and come and have time to come up with all these supposed historical analogs that exist. We uh, are we were sorry to see that, uh, but we'll have to see how that plays out. We definitely don't want them to be able to do that. But yeah, yeah that's been kind of a common request you've seen. The common defense, we're not. It's not really a defense, I guess, but a common tactic so far. Uh, among states that are trying to defend their gun laws from these sorts of suits is to ask for time to consult with, uh, you know, uh, historical experts to find potential analogs uh, so that they can make a, a more substantial claim in their, you know, uh, under the Bruin test. But um, it's been interesting because obviously first, obviously these are not new debates uh, as we're going to get into here with uh, the sort of an ancillary part of it. But um uh, you know, presumably they would, they could, <laughs> they might, uh, why they need all this extra time is, is, uh, I think an open, open question, uh, especially when this has been an ongoing debate for, for, for years. Yeah. For years I mean, point, and, and one of the arguments is going to be not to go sidetrack too much, but essentially Bruin didn't change the test. It just cut it in half. So the history test was always there, you know, that, so the state arguing that they need more time to do this new test. Well, it isn't a new test. It's the old test. However, we think this is just me opining, but uh, our thought is that what the state is actually setting up here is that if Benitez says no, they want to make a procedural appeal um, sure. to, to delay the case even more. So, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's what uh, yeah. that seems like the clear Reasoning from an outsider's perspective, uh, yeah. you know, non non lawyer. You're you're a lawyer who's involved in the case, but I'm not a lawyer, and just from the outside, that feels like uh, that's that's well, these are delaying tactics. Yeah, uh, but we'll we'll keep a close eye on that case and all the other cases that the Supreme Court has uh, GVR'd, as they call it, in recent yeah. uh, months after Bruin, as there are now five. So. Um, we, we will definitely keep in touch with you on that one. And we're going to talk a little bit later about another case that you guys just filed in, uh, in California on the uh, sensitive places uh, exception. Absolutely. And, and there's some interesting stuff there. But first, uh, let's get to uh, – well, actually, first – I want you to pronounce your full name because I think. Okay. So my full name is uh, very Greek, Constantinos yes. Moros. It's the English. Yeah. The, the English version would be Constantine, but my parents mm. saw fit to give me the Greek version on my birth certificate. So nice. uh, Constantinos Moros, I go by Costas, but that is uh, my full name. But you, you don't hunt like demons. Right? No, no, not yet. We'll see. I mean, maybe once we, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe once change. we win all our gun cases, I'll go do that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, so first off, uh, this this piece was was your idea. Uh, you know, I came in later and was editing it, and and we worked together a little bit on uh, looking a little more into the some of the the history here, some of these excerpts, and changing the story around a little bit to uh, you know just just make it a little more uh, readable for an average audience and. And we went back and forth on some of the provisions and and what these guys were actually saying, because uh, they're you know obviously our focus is on the individual right concept, but there are some other interesting uh, debates in the, during the period about the the extent of the Second Amendment and what it protects. But uh, but I, I'm interested in how you decided to do this story. You're the one who you know initiated this this piece. What what was it that made you want to write about this? Well, for one, it, it actually didn't start off as an idea for an article. What happened was, again, I'm perpetually online, probably too much, and I get into way too many arguments about the Second Amendment. And one I've seen over and over and over is this idea that the gun lobby, aka at the time the NRA, invented the individual rights view that it was never the second amendment was never seen as protecting an individual right until circa the 1960s 1970s with the nra and then you know uh conservative legal writers started pushing this view and then uh, uh, and it culminated in scalia embracing it with heller so it's all made it's a fraud and the problem is um 
this would normally not be taken seriously, except it's been lended credibility by no less than a Supreme Court justice, uh, the, the yes, chief I justice. Have this, I have the quote here in front yeah. of me. The gun lobby's interpretation of the Second Amendment is one of the greatest pieces of fraud, I repeat the word fraud, on the American people by special interest groups that I have seen in my lifetime. And that's former Chief Justice Warren Berger. Uh, and he said that in, in 1991 during a, a PBS interview. Yeah. And, and it has been cited repeatedly in popular media, right? Like, I feel like this debate has left the realm of uh, you know, academics and uh, and the legal field, right? You don't see anyone trying to make this debate in court filings anymore because the Supreme Court has settled it essentially in in 2008. Uh, but you still see this all the time <laughs> in popular media, uh, in my in my realm, right? In in newspapers and magazines, you'll see this constantly, and certainly on Twitter, yes. you'll see the dumbest the dumbest downed version of it. That, that you could just like everything else on Twitter, <laughs> um, you get the lowest common denominator version of this, but it's extreme. It's still extremely popular. Uh, I mean, you, you also say we, we found uh, you found an article from The Intercept just as recently as June 2022. So a couple months back that was perpetuating the same idea. And so um, and so, you know, obviously this is a this is something you can test. Right. It's not it's not an abstract concept or an abstract theory. Like, did did the gun lobby invent this concept that the Second Amendment protects an individual rights in, you know, the the late 1990s or what have you? Uh, or was this an idea that was around for much longer? Um, and so you started to look, uh, you started to do that exact research, right? How, why don't you just walk us through real quick how you, uh, the methodology for finding these, these references? Because we found... Quite a lot. Yeah. So um, what initially what I used to do is I would look to the founders, you know, the famous Tench uh, Cox quotes. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm saying sure. his name right. Madison and Federal. No one's 46. ever sure. Yeah. Um, he was He's not around founder. anymore to tell yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. I'm like me. Are. He can't correct his uh, <laughs> name pronunciation. But, uh, you know, Madison and Federalist 46. And of course, there's all the case law that the Supreme Court, as we mentioned in the article, has already gone through. Um, I'm sure maybe there's more out there, but the Supreme Court has done a pretty thorough historical examination of what courts have ruled. So what's right. missing in this is so those are the first two. Right? Yeah, there, there's two ways you can look at it. Go, what did the founders say, mm -hmm. and what did the what have the courts said over you know the, during that uh, early republic era, right? Uh, or and even through up till the modern time, is the court the Supreme Court looked at all all sorts of uh, legal history on on the Second Amendment when it did its major cases, but but you know the, there's a third way, right? And yeah, that's that. And the third way is. What did people in the generations immediately after the founders say about the Second Amendment? Some of whom knew the founders. Some of these people we cited, the earliest ones, were contemporaries. Others came later in the 19th mm -hmm. century. But um, thanks to how records have now been digitized, uh, it's actually very easy to go to Google Books or Google Scholar, and maybe there's other competitors out there, and you can text search for phrases and words, and you can constrain it to years. And you still have to dig through a lot, as uh, I mentioned before the show to you, uh, a lot of times you'll have to shift through dozens of texts that are just quoting the Second Amendment without any analysis. So you do have to dig through to find them, but they are there. As our article established, the, there right. were, I, I was shocked actually, because initially I, I only was doing a few posts. It's all in my original Twitter thread that the article arose from. And the, it was just a few. And then every, every once in a while I'd get bored or I'd see that stupid Warren Burger quote <laughs> and go back to the well and keep searching for more. And uh, even now, as of last week, I was finding more of them, you know, so there is a lot out there. Um, and I think it's accessible for the first time in history, frankly, because before these texts, especially the more obscure ones, would only really be available to historians and archives. You'd have to right. go somewhere where they had a physical copy of the book and read it. Now anyone can look. And that's yeah. Huge. And and looks, uh, you know, this isn't an exhaustive search necessarily. No, no, it's not. And um, we're not we're not trying to say that it is. Um, it's pretty extensive. There we have quite a lot of sources that you've managed to find this using this methodology. But obviously, it's limited to what's in Google Books. Yes, which um, is not going to be every you know piece of literature ever written. It is quite a lot, though. 
to be fair, Google has done a pretty amazing job of digitizing, uh, you know, these these archives that exist at, at a lot of you know schools and academic institutions across the country uh, and the world. So uh, it's not a limited arc. It's not that small. It's not some tiny. Um, you know, only the most famous people's writings right. ended up in here. It's, there's quite a lot of people that uh, even historians, you know, are not often reading their works or citing their works. So um, while there has been other research into this area before, of course, uh, I think. Um, I mentioned David Sh- Cop- yeah, Copel. David, yeah, David Copel's done. Yeah work on this, I Great think, back work. a, a couple, uh, you know, maybe a decade or so ago. But even that's, yeah. yeah, oh, so two, maybe two, <laughs> two or three decades ago. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that stuff is is still um, relatively uh, obscure in the sense that, like, it's it's not as widely known and published uh, as, as, like, a lot of the founders' quotes you'll find all over the place. Uh, uh, Tench Cox is, yeah. is out is all over and, the, the gun rights side of the internet. And I should but, probably say for David, sorry for the, to cut you off there, but David, if you're listening, I swear I didn't steal your idea. <laughs> I found out about your article after I had done all this. In fact, if I found your article, I might not have ever done it. Um, but I did see that I did find th- probably thanks to the digit- digitization, which he didn't have back in 1998. I did find some obscure ones that Mr. Koppel did not reference. So yeah, uh, so yeah, it's, yeah. It's sort of building on that. And this yeah. is, not meant to be an academic no, um, it's not. review. It's meant to be uh, for public consumption to yes. um, address a really a fairly limited idea here, which is just showing that this was this is not a new idea. It's just a just a bottom line. The conclusion of the piece: uh, this isn't a modern invention. This concept that the Second Amendment protects the right to keep and bear arms for all individuals is not something that the NRA came up with or David Copel invented or whoever else, right? Right. This is, this is something that has been uh, in popular belief for well, since the founding basically. And, and this sort of conversation among second generation Americans that, that we're going through in our piece, it just, uh, I mean, proves that beyond a shadow of a doubt, frankly. And yeah. And the, uh, and I want to say, I'm although I didn't find any counter viewpoints. I know Copel and his piece did. Uh, Copel and his piece did find at least one that was cited. Um, yeah, I so didn't what find was the it. Name? That was I Oliver. think it was Benjamin Oliver that I yeah. think he was cited for that one. As somebody, and in even that one is it's is, murky. It's not clear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't remember the exact quote, but it definitely didn't say there is no individual right. It just was entirely focused on the uh, uh, the militia side of things, but. Um, what I will say is there could be, if someone searches, maybe there are counterexamples out there, but that's not really the mission of what I was doing here. The mission mm-hmm. was this idea that this was a gun lobby invention is just not true. Even if there are some counterexamples out there to find, this was clearly something a lot of influential people, as well as several obscure ones in the 19th century, uh, viewed uh, the Second Amendment as protecting an individual right. Right. Yeah. Here we have... Um... Adam, just to give people an example of some of the quotes that that are in our piece, uh, we have Adam Sabert, who's a doctor who served, who's actually served in Congress from 1809 to 1815. So he was a congressman. Um, he wrote a book in 1818, and as you might imagine, a lot of these book names are uh, are hilariously long and and unnecessary. <laughs> um, as as are many of the quotes. This is sort of the common. Writing of the time was passive voice. Was, they were in love with passive voice, <laughs> and they loved adding lots of extra words that are completely unnecessary to get across their point. But that was that was the style of writing at the time. Grammarly certainly hates it. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that much. Uh, but uh, it always wanted to change every quote to be like, "Are you sure you don't need all these words?" And this is passive voice. You should change this. <laughs> but yeah, Grammarly did not exist in 1818, so. No, it did not. Uh, this, this was the way people wrote. Anyway, uh, uh, Dr. Sabert's, well, first of all, let me, let me just give you one of these titles because uh, <laughs> they're pretty funny. But his, his book, his 1818 book was called Statistical Annals. 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 And embracing views of the population. <laughs> uh, commerce, navigation, fisheries, public lands, post office, establishment, revenues, mint, Military and naval establishments, expenditures, public debt, and sinking fund 
of the United States of America. Uh, so um, <laughs> that was the title of the book. But uh, as here's what he had to say about the Second Amendment. Um, he explained, quote, our Constitution guarantees to every citizen the right to keep and bear arms, while in other countries, this very important trust is controlled by the caprice and tyranny of an individual. Um, and, and, and so, of course, he was far from the only one who who adopted this view. But, the, but that's explicit. You know, every citizen has the right to keep and bear arms, according to uh, Sabert's view of the Second Amendment. And he was, of course, a congressman at, in the early 19th century would have been the second generation. Uh, we're really probably overlapping a bit with the founding generation as well. Um, but that that's sort of uh, a very good example of some of the quotes that that we found on this topic, right? Or that you you found and, and we went through. Yeah, one of the things as we won't probably won't read all of them, but some of what what you should keep in mind, I think, when you hear some of these quotes or when you read our article, is that these were not lengthy discussions about, they didn't write a chapter about the Second Amendment. They right. usually mentioned it in passing. So this wasn't seen by Mr. Sabert and some of these other writers as a hot take of the 19th century. Like, I have some idea nobody's seen before. No, this was just something that they said that they said in passing that they didn't think was controversial even. It's, you know, you'll see some of them later where, that say stuff like you can regulate guns and yada, 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 but keep in mind there's a right to keep and bear arms, you know? So I, I think that's yeah. important. That's the important context here is that this isn't something that they thought was controversial in any way to say. That's why they mentioned it just in passing usually. Yeah. Right, yeah, and that does seem to be the case. You know, I went through and, and, uh, you know, ch obviously checked every single one of these quotes was, uh, um, you know, going through the piece and contributing my own uh, bit of it. Uh, the, one of the one of the really nice things about Google Books, too, is that you can actually link directly to a word search in a book. So at, you go to this piece, you can click on the links that are there and it'll take you to the exact excerpt where all these quotes come from. And uh, so people can literally just go and read exactly the full context of what uh, these people were saying about the Second Amendment. And you're right that most of these books were kind of like, you know, it's, they're not they're not like modern political books, which are oftentimes like, uh, you know, just opinion, very long op eds. Right. Uh, a lot of these were were more like, I don't know, uh, legal dictionaries, almost uh, the way that they're talking about. Um, the Second Amendment. I mean, some of them are legal dictionaries. Yeah, yeah. actually, literally. <laughs> literally. Yeah. But uh, but a lot of them are approaching the conversation that way. Uh, and so, you know, yeah, they're, they're just giving uh, the brevity of it lends to the idea that these were just the common views of, of what the Second Amendment meant at, at the time. Now, of course, there were disagreements. Yeah, right? of course. Uh, we, we highlighted two specific disagreements. Uh, over the Second Amendment, which I think are really interesting. We could have probably separated out into another piece, but I just figured it was nice to, you know, they, they all like like you're saying there, a lot of these takes, or a lot of these um, explanations of the Second Amendment are a paragraph or two long. So you can really just fit their whole view into a relatively short piece. Like, you know, this is longer than our normal pieces that we publish at the Reload, but it's not it's not 5,000 words or whatever. No, and it doesn't pretend to be academic. The The idea here was, uh, as you said, to give a more mainstream audience uh, an idea with citations. So if you want to go and read the sources in context, all yeah. the links are there, please do. But this yeah. is just something. Yeah, I mean, it's all in yeah. context. It's yeah. just that you're you're able to go and read everyone's, right. their full words for yourself instantaneously, which is what I really liked about this concept when you, when you uh, mentioned wanting to do a piece like this, because... Um, this is all primary. So, I mean, you know, there's secondary, secondary sources in the sense of how they're talking about what the Second Amendment means, right. but they're primary sources in the sense of how people at the time viewed the Second Amendment, which is what the piece is about. Right. So people here are getting links directly to primary sources. Uh, so they themselves can go rather than read us. Uh, I mean, obviously we, we try our best to uh, explain what the, the uh, overarching views of these people were. 
but mo- mainly through quoting them. Yeah. Um, and then and then allowing people to click the links to go and read the full context themselves. And that's an advantage, I think, that these, although, of course, what the founder said is going to be more critical because they're the founders. An sure. advantage with the 19th century stuff is it seemed language did become a bit more readable. So when you read the founders, yeah. you usually have to give context. What did they mean by this? What does well-regulated mean? What is, you know, whereas a lot of these 19th century sources are like, no, all of the people have the right to keep and bear arms, you know? Right. Yeah. And it's very clear. So that I think was helpful uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a, here's another quote. This is from Joel Tiffany, uh, who was a, a prolific 19th century author, American author. Uh, and this was in an 1850 book that he wrote, uh, where he said that the right to bear arms quote is accorded to every subject for the purpose of protecting and defending himself. If need be in the enjoyment of his absolute rights to life, liberty, and property. And this guarantee is to all without any exception for there is none either expressed or implied. And that sounds right out of a gun lobby <laughs> magazine today, right? Like that's something does. that's something you would see on Twitter. I mean, not in as pretty of words, but 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 sure. uh, that that's that's a well. This is basically the shall not be infringed. Yeah, and, and, and you, to you be see honest, that's a common meme on the uh, on on the gun rights side of things. Just to literally quote the end of the Second Amendment: "Shall not be infringed." Yeah, uh, and basically, this is what people to gun rights advocates today, especially online, are, are saying. And, and this is the maybe kind you'll of start thing. to see this quote for sure. I, I mean, for he was, and not to put too much weight on Mr. Tiffany, he wasn't like some. I, I, I can't say he was some huge authority of the time, but the, well, there were a lot of other prominent writers who felt, yeah, who essentially wrote the same exact interpretation, right? Oh no, totally. And uh, you have, for example. Uh, and this was huge with the abolitionists. I don't know if you want to jump there quite yeah, a bit. But yeah, that- we'll get into that, um, I, I think, because that's an important thing. And it also plays into one of the main uh, debates, I guess, that we found in these writings or areas of disagreement. Yeah. Um, but but first, let's just uh, real quick, I want to cover, uh, you know, the, you're saying that how clear the, the, the language is in a lot of these writings. And, um, you know, Tiffany's was extremely clear. So was. Sabert's, and so is uh, Lysander Spooner, who was, um, uh, you know, an uh, influential libertarian political philosopher. Uh, he wrote, um, the Second Amendment obviously recognizes the natural right uh, of all men to keep and bear arms for their personal defense and prohibit both Congress and state governments from infringing the right of the people, that is, any of the people, to do so. So, you know... Uh, that touches on one of the areas of disagreement, but one of the areas of commonality is this idea that it applies to any of the people. And and I got to say, uh, one thing with Mr. Tiffany's quote and with uh, and I had heard of Spooner before he remains an influential philosopher to this day. But even as someone who has his biases going into this, I was kind of taken aback by how strong some of these phrasings were. You know, I kind of expected to find the typical stuff of, you know, people have the right to bear arms uh, for their defense of themselves or liberty. But these these quotes like Tiffany saying, you know, there's no exception express or implied or Spooner saying all of the people, any of the people. And of course, he was what he was getting at was uh, African-American slaves uh, that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why don't we, let's just get into this, actually, now, because his quote brings up a, two two important points. One is that this was a very common view among abolitionists at the time. This was they were common and they were commonly using it as um an argument for why the constitution was anti-slavery, which was another thing that you saw gain prominence towards the, um, really the civil war era. You know, the abolitionists kept continue to argue that the uh the 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 constitution was actually not a pro-slavery document and uh depending on the way you read it precluded slavery and one of the ways apparently i actually didn't know this uh, i knew about that debate within abolitionists and uh and then you know because some abolitionists obviously viewed it uh, the other way that that this constitution was um you know inherently broken because of slavery uh this was a debate at the time um and clearly all the people we're citing here came down on the the idea that the constitution um if properly read and enforced would 
prohibit slavery because a lot of these rights should be guaranteed to all people, um, including slaves. Um, but, um, <clears throat> but so the, you know, the other, uh, area where this, uh, where his, this quote speaks to a, a division among some of these 19th century writers is with regard to, uh, the second amendment, uh, and how it acts on the states. Right. That this was an area where there was some disagreement in the 19th century. Uh, sorry, in the, during the 19th century, where you had a lot of uh, these writers, uh, especially the abolitionists, arguing that the Second Amendment actually does prohibit states from uh, infringing on the people's right to keep and bear arms, including all people, including slaves. And so they're arguing that actually, like a lot of black codes and and slave laws at the time that prohibited, you know, African-Americans from having guns or slaves having guns, that those were actually unconstitutional because of the Second Amendment, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, 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 uh, that's, they, they applied it to the entire Bill of Rights, but the Second Amendment certainly yes. fit into that. And if there wasn't an individual right, then they wouldn't be able to make that argument. Of course, they see that as everyone did at the time to apply to an individual right. And I shouldn't say everyone, but clearly a lot of not people, everyone. not everyone, but um, they, they saw it as applying to an individual right. And if white men at the time had the right to bear arms, then so would, of course, it would follow uh, freedmen. Yeah. Yes. The, and, and obviously that is an area where other 19th century authors disagreed Um even if they were sort there's, I know there's a quote in here um, that comes from a, a section, uh, I believe it was Flack. Is that right? Yes. Um, the dissertation. Yeah. Yeah. The dissertation on the 14th amendment, the passage of the 14th amendment. He, he says that while slavery existed, it was, uh, um, it, it was, it would logically follow that the slaveholding states could restrict the rights of slaves to have guns. And so that was the logic behind why the second amendment wouldn't apply to the states, right? That's essentially the view that he outlines there. He, not that he necessarily embraces that view, but that's, he's sort of explaining it. Yes. Um, and, uh, and obviously this was, a view that was followed up in uh, most significantly in uh, United States versus uh, Krushank, Krukshank, sorry, Krukshank, which, which was a case that found um, the, the Supreme Court overturned federal convictions for uh, white men who were involved in the murder of dozens of black men during the 1873 Colfax uh, massacre, which which was happened in Louisiana over the gubernatorial election there. Uh, at the time, and it held that First and Second Amendment protections didn't apply to the states uh, or to the actions of individuals. So the federal government couldn't, uh, the, the, the Second Amendment couldn't be used to strike down state laws or, and the federal government couldn't use it as justif justification for uh, going after um, people who, you know, tried to disarm uh, individuals. Now, this was clearly in the context of uh, white former Confederates trying to murder black, you know, black former slaves, but. Uh, Krukshank is uh, a horrific decision. I mean, there's no, yeah. yeah, we can't, you can't really beat around the bush on that but one. The, this concept. Yeah. Came, uh, became more prominent. It seems after Krukshank, uh, Krukshank yeah. which That's was correct. in 1876. Before that, you had a lot of abolitionists talking uh, about, the opposite idea that the second amendment does protect, um, against state and against state. Yeah. 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 And I mean, it wasn't just them. We don't need to go through the whole article. Of course, people can read it for themselves, but you had, you know, writers as early as uh, William Rawl back at the turn of the century and mm -hmm. uh, saying the same thing. They, they felt, uh, although he couched it in terms that were interesting, but he seemed to, uh, think that the second amendment restrained both the state and the federal governments. Yeah, that's that's what I got from his. That was sort of one of the things we went back and forth on yeah. when we were writing the piece. Uh, because here's here's his quote, so people can judge for themselves. But he he, he wrote uh, in uh, 1825 that, and he was a former district attorney, 
uh, he was actually he he sort of straddled the founding generation and the second generation because uh, he began work as a district attorney in Pennsylvania in 1791. Right. And then he wrote this book in 1825. But he says, um, quote, no clause in the Constitution could by any rule of construction be conceived to give Congress a power to disarm the people. Such a flag. <laughs> flag. Flag. <laughs> Flagitious uh, attempt, flagitious, this just means criminal, basically, uh, attempt could only be made under some general pre uh, pretense by a state legislature. But if in any a blind pursuit of, of inordinate power, either should attempt it, this amendment may be appealed to as a restraint on both. So uh, he, he seems to be saying, like, the, the, con the federal government couldn't do it because they can only do things they have the power to do, specifically granted to them by the Constitution, and rounding up people's guns is not one of them. There's no police power. And uh, so the only part, the only, this is how I read it, at least, and uh, you can give your interpretation real quick, too. But uh, so the only body that could attempt gun confiscation from the people uh, would be a criminal attempt by, you know, a rogue state legislature, state government. And uh, but even if they tried it, people could, uh, you know, appeal to the Second Amendment as a restraint against them. And it's a little unclear what he means by appeal, like whether through the court system or just like a symbolic rallying cry to oppose, you know, the, the confiscation effort. But that's where we, uh, you know, it seems like he's he also believes the Second Amendment at least has some uh, ability to restrain the states. Right. I mean, Rawl, uh, it's a little quaint that he thinks the federal government can't do something just because it wasn't uh, it wasn't in the Constitution, as we know yeah. today. But it's a common but, yeah, view back then. Yeah, it was a now. very common view back then. Uh, and some might argue it should be reinstated, but that's an article right, for another right. day. Uh, but anyways, yes, I, I, I've come around to seeing it your way. I think before I read this as clearly him saying a state can do it, um, but I didn't give enough value, I think. And that was a big contribution you made to the article. Um, I didn't give enough value in what he's actually saying, which is that. If a state does this, you can appeal to the Second Amendment. Now, by appeal, like you said, that can mean a number of things. Do they mean sue or does he literally mean there's a value here and you can start shooting your state government? Right, right, you know, yeah, like right. we're not really sure. But either way, he does see it as some kind of principled limit on the state power, whether that be the law itself or the natural right that it recognizes. Um Right. Yeah. And so that was the that was one of the disputes uh, that we that we that was found in these writings um, and from people who are relatively pot, well known down to people who kind of been forgotten by history. Uh, they all there, there was a debate about the that aspect, but there is a second uh, debate as well. Um, and that was over what the Second Amendment actually protects right. in terms of weapons. Right. Right. And it's and it's probably going to sound pretty weird to modern audiences. Right. Yeah, it, it is. Um, I, I mean, the uh, the the view today and, and it, partially because of the Supreme Court and what we're now seeing California argue in the briefing we were talking about earlier and Duncan and Miller and all these cases is that the Second Amendment is not meant to protect weapons of war. It's only meant mm -hmm. to protect your weapons of personal defense and maybe your hunting guns, but not definitely not weapons of war. And right. what we see is in the 19th century, all these writers, not all, but several of these writers, the ones we focus on in this article, said exactly the reverse. Um, right. Well, yeah. that was the debate. Yeah. The, the debate was the reverse. Yes, right? yes, yes. You had, you had people who would say, basically, this is protection of all arms or, or really not. They might not even touch on this idea, but. Uh, and so it's sort of implied that it protects all arms. Yeah, they said there was and, no conditions expressed or implied like that quote right. we read. Yeah, yeah. There, there were people who said there's just this. Uh, here, here's one right here. Uh, Thomas Cooley, who uh, was uh, Chief Justice of Michigan Supreme Court from 1864 to 1885, he wrote in 1898 <laughs> um, uh, that uh, there's no there there need. Uh, sorry. Uh, the people shall have the right to keep and bear arms and they need no permission or regulation of law for that purpose. Uh, so basically 
there you be got your guns. You, you have guns, whatever guns you and, want. And, and we should um, note here, I know we're drifting to another topic, but real quick, Cooley also expressly rejected the militia view. He, yeah, he that's the other in, interesting thing yeah, about he, his quote. He's probably one of the most famous commentators here in terms of modern day citations. And he wrote, it may be supposed from the phraseology of this provision that the right to keep and bear arms was only guaranteed to the militia. But then he writes, but this would be an interpretation not warranted by the intent. So I'm wondering if maybe, you know, it'll be an article for another day, but maybe that's where this collective rights view started to rear its head if he felt the need to yeah, respond to it. Period. Yeah, yeah, Right around in the turn it, of the century. Yeah, yeah. That would make sense because that's when, you know, a couple of decades later is when you start to get the first federal gun laws. Yeah. Uh, you know, the National Firearms Act of 1934 uh, was, you know, less, it's about 35 years after this quote. Uh, but to finish, to finish that quote, he said, the meaning of the provision undoubtedly is that the people from whom the militia must be taken shall have the right to keep and bear arms and they need no permission or regulation of law for that purpose. So, um, you know, obviously, yes, yeah, some people viewed this, the second amendment as protecting the, practically unlimited right um, to everyone for any sort of firearm. Um, you know, now obviously there's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's plenty of other debate on that, that topic that we'll get in. I'm sure we can get into it another time, but the, the other side viewed it as a more limited right, but only, but not in the way that you would hear in modern parlance. No, but, not at all. But it, um, that it only protected militia guns that would be useful in, in war, essentially. Um, for instance, we've got um, uh, Joel Prentice Bishop, who was an influential, you know, you've described him as an influential legal mind of the time who's now drifted into obscurity. It's correct. But he he's, wrote, a, he's only mostly cited now, so you know, in family law circles, apparently. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. But he wrote in 1868 uh, that the provision protects only the right to keep such arms as are use, used for purpose of war in distinction from those which are employed in quarrels and brawls and fights between maddened individuals. So uh, and this, you know, there's several other quotes um, along this line. There was uh, um uh, Black, right? Who? Uh, yeah, Henry Campbell Black of Black Law Dictionary fame. Yes, he wrote right. That. He was, who is pretty well known still today and commonly yeah. cited uh, in uh, discussions of the Second Amendment as well because of the dictionary, right? Right, and and he said um, this right is not infringed by a state law prohibiting the carrying of concealed deadly weapons, but a law which mm -hmm. should prohibit the wearing of military weapons openly upon the person would be unconstitutional. Yeah. So, so that's wild in today's context. <laughs> yeah, the, the the debate in the 19th century is pretty interesting to look at. Like, but but even even with these people who believed that there was some limit to uh, that that basically the government could limit guns that they associated with criminal behavior, um, you know, as as Bishop said, uh, those which are employed in quarrels and brawls and fights between maddened individuals. Like the even if you even the people who took that position on uh, limits to the Second Amendment, they still believed it was an individual right. Correct. Correct. I mean that th there's no other way to interpret it. They just saw it as an individual right that was limited to military weapons. They a state could restrict. You know, the common one at the time was small knives, small pistols, concealable weapons. You know, those kinds of things that would be, as he said, useful in brawls. Uh, but they could not restrict the prevailing military arms of the era, which should it should be noted. And I don't mean to get into the whole dumb musket debate here. You know, that some people make, but it should be noted that by this time in the late 19th century, repeating arms were common. So we weren't just talking about your single shot musket. We're talking about you know lever action rifles, uh, revolvers. I mean they. They said certain handguns could be bad, but not the giant, you know, non-concealable handguns. Right. Um, so these were, and yeah. Yeah. Black's quote is from 1895. That's yeah. post-Civil War. Uh, you know, you're getting closer to the modern era there in yeah. terms of gun development. Um, but but uh, to just to emphasize the point that even those who held that view uh, still believe the Second Amendment protected an individual right. We have Charles Humphrey, who wrote in 1822 that quote, riding or going armed with dangerous or unusual weapons is a crime against the public peace by terrifying the people of the land, which is punishable by forfeiture of the arms and fine and imprisonment. 
But here it should be remembered that in this country, the Constitution guarantees to all persons the right to bear arms. Uh, then it can only be a crime to exercise this right in such a manner as to terrify the people unnecessarily. So, uh, you know, he's saying that people could be locked up and have their guns confiscated if, if they're riding around attempting to terrify people, you know, basically they're criminals trying to cause, uh, you know, uh, the, um, they're trying to cause trouble actively doing that, then you can lock people up for it. Uh, but uh, the the right to keep and bear arms is, guar is guaranteed to quote all persons. Yeah. And this is another one of those uh, writers that was from a very early time, 1822, the beginning of the 19th century, uh, almost a contemporary of the founders. Some of them were certainly still alive when he wrote. So this is... Uh, that's that makes this, I think, even more persuasive. The earlier they are, a lot of the times, if they saw it this way, then I think that strengthens the persuasive value of it. Yeah, I mean, it's just I think uh, I think we set out to prove a, a fairly um, restrained point with this piece, uh, which is just that the idea Second Amendment protects an individual right is not a modern invention. And like, I just don't, there's, there's no way to say that that's not the case, right? I mean, there's just look at all these quotes. There's, these are dozens of quotes from uh, a, a wide swath of authors of the time uh, after the founding and, but before the modern era that, I mean, they, they all say that this is an individual, right? The only questionable one was uh, that you, you know, noted and we didn't, we didn't hear about this one until after publishing the piece and you weren't able to find um, this in the, in Google books, of course, and there may be others. Look, I, I, I'm very much open to publishing uh, more articles in this vein. If anyone can find, you know, a dozen sources that from the, the period that say otherwise, or from before, you know, the, the 20th century that, make this claim of a collective right, I'm, I'm happy to look at pieces like that. But um, as far as we can tell, the only one that anyone is, has come up with in response to this piece is from Benjamin Oliver. Uh, this was 1832. He published a booklet called The Rights of an American Citizen, where he spent a, uh, you know, a page. This is, this is, I believe, quoting from David Koppel's piece. Is that correct? The, yeah, this is the, uh, a piece about the collective rights interpretation and its rise. But this excerpt supposedly was citing to David Koppel. Yes. Yes. And so, but anyway, according to this, uh, Benjamin Oliver said, quote, the provision of the Constitution declaring the right of people to keep and bear arms uh, was probably intended to apply to the right of the people to bear arms for such purposes only and not to prevent Congress or legislatures of the different states from enacting laws to prevent the citizens from always going armed. A different construction, however, has been given to it. So uh, I also think what he's saying there is not entirely clear. Uh, it, it almost sounds to me more like this, what we call the limited view in our piece. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like he's, he's saying, you know, you can, uh, the states can still, Regulate. Basically, you can people can go armed if they're f doing it for the purpose of, uh, you know, uh, militia or, uh, you know, militia work or, or what have you. But but uh, not for any not they can't always go armed, I guess. And, and if anything, that sounds more like a limit on the right to carry, not necessarily the right to possess. You know, he doesn't seem yeah. to, uh, to, to exclude that. I mean. Yeah, and it just and uh, I don't know that they even gives it a that that is closer to a militia view, I yeah. guess, but not really a collective view. No, it really uh, isn't. It, it's just, but it's good to note the possible counterexamples. And mm -hmm. look, like we've discussed, there may be more out there. The idea behind this piece, though, in the research was that you, uh, this is not some invention. I, I want to reemphasize that because there might be counterexamples out there that I could not find. Mm -hmm. But even if those counterexamples exist. Clearly, the individual rights view was predominant in the 19th century, or at least very common. You know, you have all these oh, influential yeah. people um, um, arguing for this point of view. I mean, just to close out with one last one, uh, in 1900, you had Laura Donnan writing, um, 
The Second Amendment does not mean that only organized state militia may keep and bear arms, but it means that every citizen may do so. However, it does not mean that men are allowed to carry concealed weapons. So the, that she's, again, the more limited view that there could be restrictions and regulations, but this was a right of all citizens. It wasn't a right of citizens in a militia. Um, she wasn't as famous as Cooley, but she was writing around the same time as Cooley and came to the same conclusion. I don't know if she read Cooley and copied him. But, yeah, some but of these, obviously, you can yeah. see some of the influences from yeah. more famous works uh like like federalist 46 i think uh, some of the uh what's what's quoted and in, in some of these writers clearly came from that or or uh the supreme court's ruling in and uh quick quick shank yeah quick crook shank yeah, i'm really <laughs> bad with names throughout no you're this. good you're go good. read the actual piece that's all written down so you don't yeah. rely on my pronunciation um but uh, you know, you could see a lot of the influence back and forth between, you know, uh, Black's writing and Krushank, uh and and Flack's writing. So uh, it's it's pretty interesting to to watch how you know develop ideas sort of filter through and develop. Um, you know, we have I even uh, this made me go back and look at my uh, anti federalist papers <laughs> uh, book from college and and find. Uh, uh, you know, especially that militia po part with uh, 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 Cooley, where he was he's sort of responding to this idea that only the militia would have the, the right to keep and bear arms. Um, and, you know, th that made me go back to the, this. These uh, are actually the amendments to the Constitution that were proposed by uh, the Virginia delegation. Uh, or the v Virginia Con uh, Convention from June 27, 1788, and their 14th, um, 14th or 17th, yeah, 17th Amendment in this. And, uh, you know, a lot of these, you read through them, they're, they clearly got condensed down into, they're still included in the Bill of Rights, they're just sort of squeezed down into easier to read or understand formats, although some might argue that perhaps they should have left the 17th. <laughs> The way it was written here, which is, uh, quote, that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, that a well-regulated militia comp uh, composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper natural and self uh, and safe defense of a free state. The standing armies in times of peace are dangerous to liberty and therefore ought to be avoided as far as circumstances and protection of the community will admit and that in all cases, the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil powers. So it kind of, it kind of uh, really encapsulates the thinking of the time about this topic, I think. Um, uh, perhaps ancillary to what we've been <laughs> discussing, but I think that's probably the clearest uh, writing from the period. This is 1788. This is the proposal from Virginia to the uh, Constitutional Convention about um, uh, amendments to the Constitution that ended up becoming the Bill of Rights, of course. Uh, and you'll notice that it starts off with that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, and that's separate from that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper natural and safe defense of a free state, which if that sounds familiar to you, it's because it's basically exactly what the second amendment says in a few more words with the order switched around slightly how much but, trouble could they have saved us huh <laughs> yeah maybe, maybe it would have been better off but who knows uh you know obviously the the 19th century writers didn't seem to have much confusion about what this yeah and that's i think it's entailed. i almost think it's been kind of problematized by modern historians with not not necessarily even historians but lawyers with kind of a, a bias here that they are uh that they are approaching this with because by obfuscating the meaning you can make it mean something else like a militia or collective right you know and uh, and then perhaps and, and and then you have this ascendant view from most of the 20th century which led to someone like a supreme court justice saying that the original yeah. meaning was a fraud <laughs> so. and i think that's an interesting bit of new bit of history that i think you were interested in exploring yeah. that how the, how this came how we went from what people understood the second amendment to mean and the 19th century to what they stood understood it to mean in the mid to to late 20th century because obviously something 
changed and the prevailing view uh, got flipped around. And then now it seems the 21st century, things are reverting back to more what uh, people believed in the 19th century. Yeah, it's uh, the so Heller was derided, as we talked about at the start of this conversation, as an invention uh, of this mm -hmm. individual, right? When really I would contend, and I think this this research tends to support, that it was a restoration of the original intent after about several decades of this other view that had mm. prevailed for too long. Yeah. But, uh, you know, obviously I'm always happy to have other points of view on the show. If anyone wants to, to come on and, and have a discussion about this from the other, from, a, you know, a different point of view about these things, I, you know, I think... I do think that the question of whether or not the Second Amendment applied to it as an individual right, whether that's an invention of modern era, is obviously settled uh, personally. Like, I don't think there's anything more that needs to be said on that particular topic. Whether or not uh, that view is the right one, I guess you could still have make arguments about, uh, although they seem to go kind of hand in hand. But clearly this view existed back well before uh, you know the NRA was even created, um, uh, as old as the NRA is, the NRA is not a new organization either. But um, certainly, well before Wayne Lapierre took control and became uh, uh, the head of the NRA and and it became <laughs> more uh, politically active, right? Which is when people on the left will often point to you know the sort of devious creation of this idea came along. But but. Uh, you know, there, there's still plenty of other open debates on history. There's, and uh, frankly, we're going to be doing, I think in the gun world, we're going to have to do quite a lot more of these types of exercises because that's what Bruin yep, requires that's the new courts test. now. I mean, so, uh, granted, uh, the, these uh, these texts, what Bruin was talking about is laws and courts. and But I still yeah. think there's a lot of value to these uh, to these second what, like you yeah. said, they're primary for what people at the time thought. But they're secondary in terms of uh, in terms of compared to courts, because courts yes. are the primary source and laws. But but I, I but think they're still better than uh, I think they're I, I, one of the, like I said, the big things I liked about this was that we were able to give people direct access to. Oh yeah, the the primary source with these writings because they don't have to rely on our narrative about what they mean. They can go and look at all of it you know, themselves. Yeah, and, and for those of you who follow me on Twitter, there's actually a lot we didn't use because they started to get repetitive, and the article would have been way too long. But there was a lot of other obscure writers uh, at the time that because I tried to pick out the more famous ones or at least the ones who were famous at the time, even if they're not anymore. But there was a ton of more obscure writers that said very similar things. Um, and uh, we just didn't want the article to go on and on forever because yeah. this isn't a law review or an academic article. This it is probably went on too much as anyway, it is because yeah. we got into these other yeah. ancillary yeah. issues. Yeah. But I thought they were interesting, you know, for and sure. For it sure. seemed like an all right, the all right place to put them because they these quotes aren't like you know, they weren't, they're not necessarily spending an entire book talking about it. They're spending a page or a paragraph. And yeah. so, like I said, anyway, it was, it was something undisputed to them. Yeah. Speaking of Bruin and, and the new test very quickly here, cause we're already going to be, this is going to be a long episode. Uh, very, very quickly. Can you just uh, give us an overview of your, your latest case on uh, that deals with these sensitive places exception? Cause that's one of the things that the court has said, uh, you know, in, in sort of in dicta, at least that, you know, it's not it's not trying to strike down every gun regulation that exists out there. And there will be some that uh, certainly survive the Bruin test. And one of them is sensitive places, but sensitive places can't just be everything like can't be the entire island of Manhattan, as uh, I believe uh, was it Thomas or Alita that said that it was Thomas, but uh, Thomas in the main opinion. Yeah. Court, so. So your case deals, deals directly with this question. Sure, right? sure. So I, I would say that, first of all, New York does think everything could be in sensitive place. Yeah, and apparently yes. so, uh, so does California almost passed a similar law. It failed for now. Mm. We expect it'll be back next year. And if so, CRPA will be ready to take it on. But for now, we thought, uh, you know, we had been ready to go on SB 918, California's New York equivalent. We had pleadings ready. We had arguments ready, especially around the sensitive places issue. And we thought, why wait? Why we should go on the offense here? So Glendale to to make some case law and to you know protect our members who might live in Glendale or travel there frequently. Um, and Glendale has an ordinance 
that makes it so that you cannot carry guns, you cannot possess guns, not just carry, you can't possess guns on any city property. And in Glendale, city property is over 40 parks, every public library, community centers. They run three large parking structures near a major mall called the Americana in Glendale. Um, all sorts of places. They also include privately owned businesses or property if that private property is under some contract with the city, which it's impossible to know. So our lawsuit, of course, has two central claims. First of all, um, it's that these places aren't actually sensitive. You know, we, we do have a an asterisk there for if Glendale is running a courthouse or or a voting place, sure. You know, Bruin is clear that you can uh, restrict uh, carry there. But a parking lot is not sensitive. A general, and they literally use this phrase, open space, quote, quote, open space, end quote, um, that that is first of all, vague, second of all, not sensitive. Um, and they also don't require that any of these places have signs saying so. So if you go to Glendale and you park, for example, the parking structure near the mall, you would have no idea that's city owned. You would have no idea that you can't carry there. There's no sign saying it. So it puts our members for CRPA at great risk if they're in Glendale, especially now if police are trying to enforce carry laws more because they're aware of this uh, new ruling. Uh, it, it could land them into hot water without them knowing anything about the ordinance at all. But the, the main thing is that and, and to go not to drift too much into what California tried to do and what New York is doing, but it can't be that all places are sensitive or all city property is sensitive and you're just taking out huge swaths of the city because the, the meaning of the phrase sensitive and the way the court talked about it was that this is the exception to the general practice. Sensitive places are special. They're different. They can't be everywhere because if they're everywhere, if everywhere is sensitive, then nothing is, right? If if there's just yes, a- just right, like the Incredibles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the right to carry is just for streets and sidewalks, then there, that isn't much of a right anymore. So uh, that that's why we think this challenge is important. And we're hoping that the court will see it our way. Uh, we, we do anticipate filing a, filing a motion for preliminary injunction very soon. Um, and hopefully that'll send a message to California as it uh, plans to resurrect SB 918 for next year, whatever they're mm. going to call it. Um, whether they'll get that message, of course, is an open question. We see New Jersey now plowing forward with their own uh, yeah. law, even despite seeing the issues New York is facing. Uh, yep. But, but, but uh, we will continue to follow that case, and uh, perhaps we'll have you back on again to talk about it. Uh, but either way, we appreciate uh, you coming on and and contributing this piece. And obviously, you've done pieces for us in the past, and uh, we'd like to publish uh, anyone who, who's got a smart piece for us, I think. <laughs> Um, and, and you've met that bar several times now, so, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and, oh, and uh, thank you for having me. And by the way, guys, subscribe to the reload. Steven does great work. Um, <laughs> I, I finally did. I should, I thought I did a while ago and I realized I hadn't. So I subscribed, uh, you guys all should. And it's an honor, Steven. I've been following your work for so long. I, when you first asked me to do this, I was kind of like, you want to talk to me? I'm nobody, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And well, uh, you've done, you've done really impressive. Uh, oh, work and I think you uh, are are very smart. So you know, oh, thanks. I don't you know, know about you, that, but certainly I, I, we uh, you know you work for uh, you you commonly do work for a gun rights organization. So you know you're not paid by the reload to uh, no. contribute these pieces, but um, and you know we try to maintain that working relationship. But I think that uh, you know anytime somebody has something uh, intelligent to share that I think our readers would benefit from, I, I always appreciate that and and. I will look for those opportunities anytime I can. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so what, why don't you tell people, uh, cost us where you can, where people can find. Oh, okay. Real quick. So, uh, my Twitter, as a lot of, you know, I spend way too much time on there is Moros Costas. So my last name first, M O R O S K O S T A S. Uh, I work for Michelle and associates. I would venture to say, although there's a lot of great attorneys out there, we're the best at what we do and not just for gun law stuff. We do all sorts of other stuff unrelated to gun laws. So come talk to us with your general, uh, litigation and representation needs. Um, and of course, California Rifle and Pistol Association, CRPA, wonderful organization focused in California. If you're in California, or even if you're not want to, inf uh, you want to help out CRPA, go visit crpa.org and uh, uh, become a member, support us, whatever you'd like to do. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kostas, for joining the show. Hopefully I've figured out how to pronounce your name. Properly you got it at the end. The, <laughs> the end here. Um, but we're going to head over to the the news update now. So thank you. Thanks, Stephen. 
All right, it's time for the news update. I'm joined by contributing writer Jake Fogelman, as always. How are you doing, Jake? Doing great, Steve. How are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, I got the the Phillies are playing today. We're recording on Friday, so hopefully they can pull off uh, another first uh, home playoff game in 11 years, right? So yeah, <laughs> it's pretty pretty exciting. Uh, hopefully we can pull it off. Go go Phils! Uh, but for our purpose here on the podcast. We have actually two stories this week. Uh, first one is out of New York, right? Can you give us a little detail? We got an update on the the, the case against New York's latest gun restrictions. There was a federal judge that issued uh, a temporary restraining order blocking enforcement of most of the controversial provisions like the Times Square gun ban, the public uh, transit gun ban, the the, uh, <laughs> the, the just a magnitude of, of gun bans across the state that made it very difficult to carry a gun legally almost anywhere uh, in New York, including private businesses uh, that that uh, operate you know open to the public. That was blocked as well. What is what's happened now? Yeah, so like like you pointed out, there was a temporary restraining order issued on most of those provisions, um, but it was delayed by three business days to allow for the state of New York to decide if they wanted to appeal or not. And of course they did. Um, so for a while, we didn't hear anything. We we're kind of wondering, oh, maybe nothing's going to happen. Um, but th- the day before the temporary restraining order was supposed to take effect, uh, a single judge from the Second Circuit came out and issued basically an administrative stay on that restraining order, not allowing that block to go into effect. Because essentially what happened is the Second Circuit hasn't even gotten to this matter yet. Uh, and so basically it was just to delay delay the block from going into effect until a three judge panel of the second circuit actually sits down and takes a look on the merits of New York's appeal to once again, block the temporary restraining order. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's even less uh, severe than that, I guess. It was a temporary stay on a temporary restraining order, which is funny enough, but, but uh, I think it's only blocking it until that panel right. is sat and then decides on whether or not to right. continue this stay and then goes to the merits. So it may not last very long. It's not clear. You know, obviously the Second Circuit has been traditionally pretty uh, friendly towards the government in these cases, uh, upholding a lot of gun restrictions. But of course, the major difference now is that they have to operate under the Bruin standard, which is uh, a higher bar to clear for government regulation of firearms, uh, which the lower court judge obviously uh, was ruling under and, and found all of these provisions to be unconstitutional uh, or likely unconstitutional. He didn't rule on the merits. He, he although was, his ruling notes that you know the, the standard for temporary restraining order and the standard for a preliminary injunction are basically the same thing. So um, it was with courts. You know, there's always like, well, they're blocking it, but it, there's not a full ruling on the merits. Technically, you know, there's a lot of technicalities when it comes to legal situations, of course. And so this one is this this story is filled with them because we're now like, like I said, we're in a temporary stay of a temporary restraining order that's stayed until a uh, three judge panel. It was stayed by a single judge until a three judge panel can look at the stay and see if it should continue to go on. Um, but we'll, we'll see how that happens. You know, obviously stays are pretty common in these kinds of cases, especially if you're in a circuit that, uh, if you're a gun rights plaintiff and you're in a circuit, that's not very friendly towards gun rights plaintiffs. You, even if you get a good ruling from a lower court judge, you're often going to have your, your, uh, case stayed pending appeal so that the government can continue enforcing its laws. I, you know, whether that's the right approach is uh, leave that up for other people. I, it's personally, I don't, I don't love it. I would prefer in a case where uh, a law was ruled to be unconstitutional that it not be allowed to remain in effect uh, while the case is decided. But uh, you know, I'm not a federal judge, so. <laughs> well, especially because the whole rationale behind a temporary restraining order is plaintiffs are likely to, to suffer harm if this keeps being forced. So to put a stay on something that puts them at risk of suffering harm is, is interesting. Yeah. I mean, they could be, they could be arrested, but I mean, that's the idea of, you can make that argument with pretty much every stay that gets put in place on, on a, a ruling against a, a particular law. 
so it's not exactly a, a new thing or an uncommon thing or or something that's you know, uh, the restricted to gun cases. This happens across the board. But uh, that's the latest in that case. So, uh, you know, New Yorkers who are listening to this, just make sure that you stay up to date with that because uh, one day it might seem like uh, it's legal for you to do something and the next day it goes back to being a felony. So uh, uh, technically in this case, it, it was it remained in effect the whole time. But, um, you know, I'm sure people were anticipating that maybe – by well, Wednesday or Thursday this week, it was going to uh, the the enforcement was going to be blocked, and it turns out that that's not the case. So it's important that everybody understands that. Um, but we also have another story, and this one deals with Mexico, right? Yeah, so Mexico is back in court. Um, we covered previously their attempt to sue a lot of the big gun manufacturers, um, like Smith and Wesson, Glock. It's a whole host of, of major gun manufacturers. Um, and it was tossed because the judge ruled that it was precluded by the PLCAA, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, which basically shields these gun companies from liability for third-party misuse of legally sold firearms. Mm -hmm. um, so that was dismissed two weeks ago, and Mexico came right back and filed another suit, uh, this time in federal court in Arizona, against five just FFLs, basically gun dealers that are kind of located near that border down there in southern Arizona. Essentially making a similar argument that these gun dealers are negligent and allowing their guns to be sold to straw purchasers who then traffic them into Mexico and, and supply cartels. And um, so it's, it's a similar situation where, once again, they're trying to sue the U.S. gun industry for the violence that takes place in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Now, you read the complaint. Did they offer any specific evidence of these gun dealers being involved in, you know, trafficking of guns or intentionally selling guns to people they knew weren't allowed to buy them? Well, they they provided specific examples of straw purchasers being caught who had purchased those guns at these particular stores. Right. But th they're mostly just accusations about, well, they should have known that they were straw purchasers. They never make yeah. any claims that they sold them without background checks or that they knew that the person was lying about whether they were going to be the sole possessor of the gun. It's right. basically just an insinuation that, oh, they should have known. So, yeah, so no direct evidence then. Uh, and, and they made a number of claims and it seemed like none of them were backed up with direct hard evidence that these right. gun dealers actually committed any crimes of any sort. Because uh, yeah, like you said, I mean, a straw, straw purchase, that's when somebody who can legally buy, gun, uh, buy a gun goes in and buys a gun, but does so with the intention of, of giving it or selling it to somebody else who they know cannot legally own or possess a gun. And, and uh, so that's very difficult for a gun dealer to uh, be able to know off the bat. I mean, if this is the kind of person who will pass a background check. That's the whole idea of this this uh, particular tactic for gun runners or gun traffickers is that they know that these people are not going to get caught uh, in the system. Now, they may get caught later on, hopefully. Right. That's the goal. Uh, or, you know, and a gun dealer might have uh, an intuition, an, <coughs> sorry, a, an intuition that there, there's something off about the buyer or they might, you know, notice something and report them to the ATF. That's a very common thing. That's uh, talked that, about that at, at length uh, on this podcast and, and in our reporting about how, you know, the industry and the ATF work together often in these sorts of cases where um, people, dealers might suspect somebody of being uh, you know, a straw purchaser, they'll, they'll report that. But, but, you know, unless there's some evidence that these dealers knew that the purchasers were in fact straw buyers, uh, you know, this whole lawsuit seems doomed to fail. And, it, and honestly, and I think you, this was in your piece, but, um, Although I might have written it in there, I don't remember. <laughs> I did edit the piece, but uh, uh, if they had hard evidence of this, presumably they would go to law enforcement. They would go to the ATF and share that evidence so that these dealers could be prosecuted instead of suing them in civil court as their sort of backup suit for when their previous suit failed. Yeah, yeah, like you said, it's a federal crime if you're abetting a, a gun yeah. trafficking ring with straw purchases. Like right. I said, it seems like law enforcement would be perhaps the more sensible route to go. Um, yeah, not a RICO but, suit, which uh, right, right, yeah, yeah, they file a RICO suit, which once again, like yeah. most people, if you're a lawyer listening yeah. to this, you know how 
silly that is and how misused RICO statutes are in mm-hmm. plaintiff led litigation. So exactly. I mean, we're not lawyers, but we follow uh, lawsuits pretty closely here. And uh, I think one of the things that's a red flag for whether a lawsuit is serious or not is whether it's trying to make a bunch of RICO claims, uh, right. which almost never succeed. Uh, so, so uh, you know, it's uh, this is it's a, it's, an, it's a weird it's a weird situation to me. Um, you wrote in a whole analysis piece about this from members, but I don't I don't understand Mexico the Mexican government's motivations here. It seems like a a high risk thing to do for what's basically just a symbolic gesture. Uh, you know, be, high risk in the sense that like this is likely to alienate a lot of. Uh, Americans, especially lawmakers, especially you know Republicans or or pro gun uh, lawmakers, uh, especially those in border states, right, like Arizona and and Mexico, uh, or sorry, Arizona and, and Texas, uh, where you have a lot of Republican uh, lawmakers, and uh, you know it just there it's very unlikely they're going to win this case, just to be flat out about it, you know, and so. I don't know. Uh, you, you had a, you had some guesses at the the potential motivation here. Uh, it seems it seems like a just a symbolic thing, right? Is that, that right? Was, yeah, I uh, think it's it, it, it's a good point to make that they that you risk alienating people, and the the symbolism is perhaps maybe to say, you know, to show that the government can go back to its people and say, look what we're doing to help stem cartel violence that's terrorizing your lives that we haven't been able to get a a good grasp on. So. If we can stick it to right. those Americans that are fueling the violence, maybe that's a political win for them. I, I, it's yeah, tough to say. I guess that seems to be the calculation. I mean, obviously, this is also driven uh, in large part by uh, gun, American gun control groups. In this case, it's uh, Brady uh, United uh, was uh, one of the parties involved in this case and helping file it. Uh, this is part of a larger effort to try and pierce the the shield of uh, PLCAA that's been ongoing for decades, right? Um, you know, it's not um, a new tactic necessarily. It's a little bit different to try and rope in a, a, a foreign government right. to uh, be involved in this case. But, uh, you know, it doesn't seem likely to succeed uh, at all, frankly. It's like bo- bordering on frivolous and um, clearly implicated by the the PLCAA. So uh, barring some sort of shocking twist in in the case, I, I don't think this is going anywhere. And, and um, you know, it, it, I don't know that it's going to be successful in trying to uh, alleviate political pressure back home. I mean, why does Arizona have a, a murder rate that's like a fifth of Mexico's if they're the problem? That from you know if they're the cause of Mexico's violence, you know it doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Um, but uh, you know this is not an uncommon thing to see. I mean, really, we talked about uh, we covered Philadelphia uh, recently, where they uh, passed a city ordinance banning guns in parks and rec centers that is illegal under state law, and immediately got blocked by a state judge, and they've been doing that forever. It doesn't do anything practically to um, stop the murders from occurring in Philadelphia, which has had over 400 this year, but it's perhaps, I guess it still seems to the mayor, uh, Mayor Kenny in Philadelphia to be a a useful political messaging tool, I I guess, like to show that you're trying to fight, uh, but, you know, trying to tighten gun laws. Um, and that can be politically persuasive to some people. I mean, it keeps happening in Philadelphia and, and places like that because uh, presumably the constituents there are not upset about it, uh, even though they're, they always lose these cases. Um, so maybe that's going to happen in Mexico. You know, obviously we're not experts on the domestic political situation in Mexico. So right. I, I don't know. It just seems risky on uh, as far as international relations go uh, between Mexico and pro-gun politicians in the United States.
No, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, but of course, you know, we're going to have to see how the lawsuit develops. As you said, barring any unexpected twists or a particularly uh, maybe perhaps activist judge, I don't really see this going any differently than their last lawsuit. Um, but like you said, we'll have to see. Right. They'll probably end up with the same judge, I, would, I, I, I might expect. You know, oftentimes cases that are similar, just like that New York case, uh, there was initial iteration of that New York case that got dismissed for lack of standing. And then when Gun Owners of America brought it again with new plaintiffs uh, that established standing, it went to the same judge. Um, that's That happens often in federal litigation. So I would be be interested to see if the, that's where this case ends up too, if it's in front of the same judge who just dismissed the last one. Because, uh, you, you know, it's kind of an efficiency thing. Like they're making very similar claims uh, usually they get the same judge they just litigated in front of before. So, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, you never know what'll, what'll go down. Uh, maybe these claims are better somehow than previous claims. They don't appear to be on the surface. Um, and they were the second claims that they went to instead of the first ones, which implies they perhaps don't have as much faith in these, these ones succeeding as they did in the last ones and the last ones failed. So I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, if you want to read more about it, you should head over and check out Jake's uh, members piece. And to do that, you'll need to buy a membership, of course, so you can get exclusive access to read the full piece of analysis from from Jake and uh, also get access to hundreds of other exclusive analysis pieces that we've done uh, at the reload. Just uh, check out our membership options today. Just head over to the site. And you'll get this podcast a day early as well and the opportunity to, be, to appear on the show like we had a, a great member, uh, Alan, from New York City last week on the show. Uh, you guys should go ahead and check out that uh, that segment. If you can, we put it on YouTube. We, we, we uh, cut up clips from the show and put them on YouTube. So if you want to get uh, sort of these and more digestible dot com, at, uh, just search for the reload and um yeah, we'll we'll be back again next week. Make sure you uh, rate and s- review the show if you can. If you want to help us out, if you want to spread the word, that's the best way to do it. Um, and otherwise, you know, go over, check out our membership, sign up for the free newsletter. If you want to get a taste of what what our reporting is like, and then buy a membership if you want to support our work. That's how we make our money. We are not beholden to anyone else, just our members. So, uh, buy a membership today. All right, that's it for this week.